The premise that you have, though, throughout your book uh, has to do with the impact of movies, not only on us culturally and socially, but also on technology and technology on us. That's right. Um, you know, film itself is a, is a technological medium, so it's appropriate that it's dealing with the problem of technology. And one of the main things that mythology does is it adapts the human psyche to changes in the environment. And our environment, uh, as a result of technology, is changing faster than it ever has before in history. So it's vitally important that we have poets and artists, and in this case now filmmakers, who are capable of creating these scenarios that show how the human psyche is responding to these new technological environments. Because every time a new technological environment comes along, it puts stresses and strain on us that we don't always realize and we're not always consciously aware of. But the artists are subliminally aware of these stresses and they picture them in metaphoric language, like War of the Worlds is a classic example where we get this invasion by these gigantic machines. That's a wonderful metaphor for the fact that, you know, that, that H.G. Wells wrote that in the 1890s, right at the end of the 19th century, just as the Industrial Revolution was really, really hitting full momentum. And so it's a wonderful way of picturing the metaphor of the fact that we are under attack by machines and we have to deal with that. This, the psyche and the body are responding to those stresses and they're processed through these stories. And, and that's we're why be, they come up. We're going to be talking about not only uh, movies in and around War of the Worlds, uh, but uh, John David Ebert graciously in Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons has included so many other areas and, and eras, including what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. What is he talking about? You'll find out in just a moment if you care to stick around. We have guests on like John uh, David Ebert, uh, who is the author of Southern Lloyd Heroes and Mechanical Dragons for a number of reasons. One is because I love this stuff. I just love the whole idea of the metaphor, the comparisons between motion pictures that are made now by the Spielbergs and by the Lucases and those legendary people that came out of Iceland and those superheroes that came out of the far north and out of Central Europe uh, 1,000, 1,500 years ago. Uh, it, it seems that all cultures have always had a quest for superheroes and myths and monsters, and John David Ebert, uh, I think, uh, eloquently uh, puts it into, uh, into uh, a, a very readable kind of prose uh, in this book. Uh, and I was mentioning the opening to the shadow uh, at the end of the last segment, what evil lurks in the hearts of men. And uh, th there's a unique kind of acknowledgement of radio heroes, radio crime fighters that you have in this book. Please, if you will, pursue that for a moment. Yeah, there's, I have a chapter on the origins of the comic book superhero. And uh, I went back and tried to find where the earliest, specifically comic book superheroes originated. And I found out that it was indeed radio. Now, there are pulp fiction action adventure heroes that go back beyond radio to the pulps that came out, you know, right around the turn of Flash the Flash Gordon, uh, Buck Rogers. Yeah, people. and these were, these were comic strip, uh, the Sunday comic strips, uh, Flash Gordon and uh, Buck Rogers. Uh, but uh, a little bit be just before them, uh, the Shadow was the first uh, real superhero, and defining a superhero here as somebody who is fighting uh, crime in New York City, specifically in that milieu, the superhero is tied to New York. And uh, he's really, it's immune system and keeps the monsters out of the city. And secondly, that he has an alter ego, that he dresses up in a costume and goes out and fights. And the Shadow's the first figure that, that fulfills that criteria. And it's interesting that it was radio that brought that about because radio is a non-visual medium and it activates these auditory parts of the mind that bring the imagination in and you sort of fill in the pictures yourself. And this is why the Shadow is such a, a a non-visual character, for example. His laugh echoes uh, from all directions, just as radio travels with, through electromagnetic uh, radiation coming at us from all directions and moves at light speed, and the shadow seems to be everywhere all at once. He can he, cloud men's minds exactly. so they cannot see him. Yes. A trick uh, learned yeah. many years ago while visiting the Orient. I, you know, uh, those things those things stay with you. I have no idea why. I don't remember where I parked my car, but I remember the whole description 
of that shadow character yeah. and Batman and Superman and Captain Marvel. Uh, but all right, so we still have Batman though. Is yeah. he different yeah. than Batman in the comic book? He is different in many ways. Um, and particularly the superhero is undergoing a transformation as it migrates from the comic books to film because for one thing film is a much larger mass medium and there's a kind of a dilution. Um, a lot of these movies are made not with much, I mean they're made by huge corporations that don't care too much about the quality of the stories unlike a lot of the illustrators and artists of the comic books. So there's a, the storytelling tends not to be as good although with the new Batman film, Batman Begins, it's much much better than it has been in the past. And uh, there's also a danger, too, that the superhero is becoming, in film, unmoored from New York City. If you remember, the Hulk took place in San Francisco. I was so always wondering to... why it is that with Gotham uh, or, or New York similar uh, cities, and never La Jolla. There was never a superhero right. from La Jolla. Yeah, that's because New York has a problem, and that is that it's one of the world's first entirely secular cities that was designed by the Dutch in the 17th century primarily for the purpose of making money. Religious concerns were of no interest. And so as the city evolved and the skyscrapers began to come up and they got taller than the cathedrals, they displaced the religious sensibility. And you ended up uh, right about in the 1930s when radio was coming along uh, and King Kong, for example, which came about right in 1933, is the first film to feature a giant monster attacking New York City. And it's right after that film happens, the shadow had already been going, but right after that you start getting Superman and Batman and all these heroes who start originating as a kind of immune system in the city which has no mythology. And because it has no mythology, it doesn't have an, a, a kind of psychological immune system to protect it from invasions from the beings of ancient myth that we think, or that New Yorkers think, have no relevance to their city, but in fact, the, the, these figures sleep in the residue of our ancient consciousness and they come back and they can cause psychoses, as Carl Jung well knew, they can cause all kinds of psychological problems. So the reason the comic book superhero originated in New York City is, is precisely because it was a city without a mythology and, and, and comic book superheroes are a kind of provincial mythology and immune system of New York to defend it from uh, you know, beings out of ancient myth. They're, have they're these, these, have these elements been present in all cultures? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you go back and look at the earliest uh, monster slaying stories, like with Gilgamesh, that's one of the absolute earliest. Gilgamesh was a superhero tied to the city-state of Uruk. He originated in the city-state of Uruk, and uh, his primary job was to fight monsters and keep them out of the city. Now, Uruk was a city, unlike New York, that had a long religious tradition, lots of cults and so forth. Uh, but Gilgamesh, be, there were major changes that, that the Sumerians were undergoing as they sled in, into, as the society fell apart and moved into a Babylonian world. And the Babylonians inherited Gilgamesh from the Sumerians. And like with the comic books, they turned him into a universal hero instead of a provincial hero just tied to the city state of Uruk. And he became this universal Semitic uh, warrior hero fighting monsters all throughout Mesopotamia instead of just the one province. So something you, we've only got 30 seconds left. You've uh, grown up here, so you know yeah. that Spielberg uh, spent a lot of time in Scottsdale. Yeah. As a 14 year old, uh, maybe even a 12 year old, he used to come down to the Wallace and Lamo show right. with little Super 8 things that we would yeah. preview for his next film presentation uh -huh. that he would do. Is Spielberg an example of a, a really good modern myth maker? Uh, the best, I think. Uh, Steven Spielberg is probably the best. And, and probably the reason for that is, ironically, because he's not a very literate guy, and he has said publicly that he does not read books, and so he approaches this material with a wonderful naivete that just comes to him spontaneously. When you read Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons by John David Ebert, you will see everything. If uh, with the possible exception of the phrase, look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, no, it's Gilgamesh. We'll be back in just a moment on The Pat McMahon Show.